to the Spider Queen, our first map between Team Banana Age and Team Sven, everybody. Vanishing Up Season number two continues. And again, as we're heading into game number two, just a quick recap. So, teams for the tournament. Question keeps popping up. How were these teams formed? Fairly easy. We decided to go for a captain's draft this time. We've ran captain's draft tournaments every now and then over the last five, six years, obviously. Uh, time and time again. And what happens is that you sign up as an individual player, not as a team. And then the players chose the captains. So we had more than 100 players sign up. The players voted on who they wanted to be the captains. And after the captains were determined, the captains drafted their teams out of that player pool. So that's how the teams came to pass here. We have for the Banshee Cup also, again, as in season number one, $2,500 of prize money, courtesy of Kevin of Psykiv, who is still the chaperone of Heroes of the Storm here. And we have split the prize pool this time. So we maintain the bounty system that we introduced in the first season, but we have adapted it. We have $1,500 now that are going to the top three just in any regular tournament. And we have 1,000 that are in the bounty pool. So if you remember in season number two what we did, we introduced the system for the first time because we wanted to incentivize teams to take a bit of a risk and play heroes or talents that are not being played all that often and that are kind of fun. And we wanted to do that by giving them some money if they did it. And we gave them a flat amount in the past season. But we also wanted to experiment a little bit with the system because it was the first time we used it. And we took the feedback not only from the community, but also from the players. We looked what gets played, what doesn't get played, and then adjust the system. And now we have a fixed bounty pool that is $1,000. And by completing a bounty, a team gets a ticket for that pool. They can get multiple tickets depending on how many bounties they complete. And at the end of the tournament, they get a share of those $1,000 depending on how many bounties were completed and how many bounties they themselves were able to complete so something that they can do it's all optional if teams don't want to do it and they don't want to give themselves a handicap that's obviously not a problem it's just a bit of an incentive to make this happen but we saw already some amazing games thanks to that and I think we're going to see more as we're going into best of fives for example or into the group stage currently we find ourselves in the round robin phase of the tournament and then afterwards we're moving on to a group stage now with the bounty system, it's also quite important to note some of these bounties are easier to complete than others. It's absolutely by design. And it's also, we went for bounties that we perceive to make the games more fun. Not necessarily to just see things that normally are not getting played. If we just were aiming for that, we could, for example, also throw out a bounty with Tiger's playing drill. But Tiger's drill is just boring. Drill is there, that's brrrr, and nothing happens, and that's it. So, good example of a bounty that we didn't want to use. So we settled for these. We want to keep it simple. We don't want to make the bounties too complicated. There's always a couple of people that are jumping in. What about if we go for a wombo combo bounty where you have to layer this and that and then you have to turn yourself three times in a row and you have to do it after level 20 and only when your opponent is like on the top of the map and the objective is up and way too complicated. It's already tough enough to explain to most viewers that not don't watch every single game what's going on in the first place. Players are getting confused too. So we're going to try and keep it simple as much as we can. And yeah, that's essentially it. Now, as we're heading into game number one of this series, yeah, our best of three, we have Lucio and Hanzo already locked in. Seems like Team Sven is going for the good old uh, Team Overwatch strategy, only breaking that mold a little bit with Leoric. And we have Blaze and Junkrat on uh, the other side. So Team Banana Age. No, trying to get Blaze out. I was also asked, by the way, to not call Okmek Okmek because it's Fancy Pants. Uh, he uh, got an account lent to him simply because he doesn't have all the heroes on his own account. Yeah. Happy to oblige. At the same time, if you want to get your name called out correctly, use your own account. Rule number one. Garrosh and Malfurion are in. So we have Jean Lassalle now trying to rock it with Malf. If Garrosh gets a good throw in straight into the roots, then we got that. And over on the right side, what do we get here? We got Arian and Ether for the final two picks for the team. Um, let's see what we're grabbing. We still need a main tank for them here on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Jojo has actually been banned away from them. We would probably benefit from a bit of wave clear too. Maybe a mage there. Nubrak and Kelsas. Are we gonna get a bounty attempt by them? They could still go for a bounty with Kalthos at this point. So, time will tell. Would be pretty sweet. We had... Uh, Nano could also swap. I mean, Nano von Hanzo is obviously super dangerous, but he can also play Kalthos, and he has done it in the past. 
So are they going to go for Convection? I'm going to try to use that. They attempted it once, but they didn't win the game. So yeah, that was a problem. Now we got Banana Age on Tracer, and that sets us up for game number one. Two of Spider Queen, everybody. Team Sven against Team Banana Age. Let's go. Game number one, Team Banana Age over on the left side in blue with the captain on Tracer. We got Johan on Garrosh, Itrax on Junkrat, Jean Lassalle on Malfurion, and Fancy Pants playing on the account Okmek with Blaze. Over on the right side of the map, we got Sven on Leoric, Captain Rex on Lucio, Arian on Anubarak, Ethan on Kalthas, has not chosen his level one yet, just to point that out, and Nano on Hanzo. So Nano this time not swapping over. And nah. Hashtag no balls. Ether is going for the Globe Talent. Going straight into Mana Addict. So no attempt to play this one out with the bounty. It would have been kind of fun. But they're deciding against it, at least in game number one. Okay. Fair enough, fair enough. They want to get the 1-0 lead first before they make another play. But obviously a bit of a sad moment here. Nice battle in the middle on the other hand. So everybody is already coming out swinging as they're starting to look for kill number one in the game. With Fancy Pants now moving down to the bottom of the map. And in the meantime, we have the move towards the middle and top as the rotation starts to continue. The two teams attempting to make a couple of plays here. Trying to go for first blood, trying to go for the gems, and trying to go for map control. If you control the rotation, specifically at the beginning, there's obviously quite a lot of work you can do with that. Uh, once again, we got... Uh, maybe a little bit of a chance. With the new Barak, you can of course unleash a few stun chains here, specifically once that you have Hanzo's arrow as a potential backup. And on top of that, you also have the gravity labs from Kalthas that can come in. And he's doing already the best he can in order to get himself his level 1 quest completed. You want to complete that as quickly as possible. Uh, there's the stun against Sven. Okay. And the flip. Captain Rex about to go down. And it's Leoric that dies. It's dead. Bomb connected with Tracer. So Banana Age gets a kill for his team. They're also denying a few gems to uh, the other team. Not a huge amount, but again, every little bit matters at the beginning of the game. And of course, on top of that, they also have the Siege Giant now, which do some damage. Here. It's nothing insane, but yeah, you're building small advantages and you're trying to build a hole. And they take out Kelsas. Nice double kill as the game begins for Team Banana Age. And Team Banana Age, of course, on an absolute tear in this tournament. They are undefeated in matches. They've been really the team to beat so far. They came close to losing a series a few times, but somehow were always able to turn it around. So, pretty impressive. I mean, really impressive performance by them. Can they maintain that record though? That's the big question here. Team Sven going for their own camp after the blue team has already locked in the mercenary camp on the left side. So they got that pretty quickly. But now the battle in the middle continues. They went for Nubarak again. Yeah, and the Nubarak has to be really careful. If you're going up against Garrosh with the Nubarak, you have to keep your burrow charge. You gotta be careful. If you burrow charge just simply blindly towards Garrosh, then it is essentially a death sentence if he plays well and they anticipate you because he's just gonna throw you into the back of the team and then you're gonna get absolutely murdered. So they gotta be very, very careful how they're playing this one out. So a bit cautious here for Anubarak and his boys. But again, so far they have been... Well, you don't want to say struggling. I mean, they lost two. So there's that. But off we go. Johan gets attacked. Another little attack over here. Can they go for Johan? Maybe Arion? It's Garrosh that falls. And Arion gets out with 30 hit points on Anubarak. Not bad. Yeah. Nicely done. Okay, so as this is the case, we're having at the bottom of the map still Leo reigning uh, supreme here. And there's the drain. Uh, 10 stacks for Kalthas, by the way. It's only fitting that he died so quickly in the game. He would have, of course, survived if he went, if he went for convection like a real man. <laughs> it's actually kind of fun to me. <laughs> I'm now making fun of Kalthas players that play mana addict just because we have a bounty connected there. Don't try this crap at home, by the way. Obviously, Convection is an absolute trash talent that you should not pick 
if you are playing seriously. If you're just trying to have some fun in quick match or uh, whatever else, then hey, by all means, do whatever you want. But if you're trying to win the video game, then you're much better off with Mana Addict. But that's the beauty of the bounties. And to be fair to Team Sven, they've already tried that. They've already tried that in the past here. So, yeah. Well, let's see what happens. I mean, I actually know what happens. If you watched all the games in the tournament, you know that I was confirmed a prophet. The Church of Kaldor, aka Kok, was founded, and I'm its prophet and savior. I know what's happening. I'm just trying to make this as interesting as I can so that you guys, you know, get a bit of excitement out of it. But I can obviously see the future, as was consecutively proven multiple times now in one specific series. And Nuburak dying wasn't a surprise to me. Banana H recalling and then A being able to get away. I knew that was happening. So I am just doing this to you for your benefit. That's essentially what's happening here. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you need to watch the rest of the matches in this tournament because again, it is not even a debate anymore. It has been settled. Red team gets the Web Weavers. So we have for now the first objective in the hands of Team Sven. Two kills to three now. Experience is roughly the same. Not too bad. Oh, if they can get a kill here, that would be sweet. But they don't have enough damage. And with Jungret moving in, there's also nothing to really be done about it. Leorki dying at the bottom of the map. Sorry, activating his trade. Activating his trade. Drawing resources from the other team. Snacking up some of their cooldowns. But Garrosh dying. That's a bit of a problem. And Malfurion dies too. And the timing could not be worse. Just as the web... Oi, oi, oi. Now all the gems are lost too, as Nano is showing once again why he is such a good Hanzo player. He absolutely murders them. Nano killing them where they stand. Now they have level 10, they got web weavers, they got everything. The attack is coming at the top in the middle and they're going to get mad value out of the first objective here. With heroic abilities, they're starting to instantly burn down the fort in the middle. The one at the top is about to fall too. And that's five kills to four now. So yes, huge momentum all of a sudden for Team Sven in game number one as they are bringing the pain here. Absolutely. The pulse rounds on level 10 now for Tracer. We're getting also Decimate. And that was a sexy, sexy play here. Nano with the triple kill, and it couldn't have happened at a better moment in time. Just as the web viewers were touching ground, and that was huge, absolutely huge. So they are ahead, inexperienced by a bit, but it's really just the forts that they took out that is great for them. And some of the gems were denied. Now, to be fair to the red team, uh, to the blue team, they didn't lose too many gems. It's not that they lost their ticket back into the game, but they lost some. Now the counter kill. Oh, Garrosh and Lucio both dead. Kill for a kill as they're trading punches. Blaze with the bunker. Bunkering up super quickly here. And, ooh, pot of gold. Nice. So, that's actually a trick. Leo's dead. And it's time to... Leon, again, he's just drawing resources. This is the third time that Leoric was drawing some of the cooldowns away from the rest of the team. I would love, honestly, <laughs> now that I just saw that, <laughs> I would love if we had like some goblin skin for Junkrat and then he just like, maybe like a leprechaun or something and he just runs around and like throws pots of gold everywhere. Something like that. I think you can make some pretty cool things with leprechaun Junkrat and just explosions coming in everywhere with him laying down mines, throwing grenades or something. That would be amazing. I think there's a couple of really cool skin ideas that they could go for. So yeah, let's make that happen. Leprechaun Junkrat. <laughs> Let's go. 41 gems now turned in for the blue team as they're still hoping for their first objective. And there it is. Gets finished. So 7 kills to 6. And they're even ahead in experience. So now the moment where they can try and uh, turn things around just a bit. The red team has turned in a fair amount of their gems as well. But there's also level 13 talents. Just a little bit faster for Team Banana Age. Which is pretty respectable considering that they lost so much earlier. But here we have it, both teams with the same talent here. Pyromaniac is in, and the attack straight through their middle. Starting to take down the first tower, starting to make a play right there. And can they go for a forward? I don't really think so. Phoenix is out in order to strengthen the defense a little bit and make sure that the Web Weaver is not going to get too much value. They're taking the wall out, but I think the forward will be fine. 
the blue team is basically committed. But nice flip, nice... Ah, oh, beautiful isolation. And Nubarak is gone. He is eliminated. And now the path to the fort is open. They're definitely not going to take two here. But they are farming Leorki again for the extra XP. And they get the fort in the middle. So pretty strong. Uh, pretty strong. Pretty solid. Also heading kills now. Team Banana Age is definitely finding their stride here. Can rotate now down to the bottom of the map. Maybe push through this a bit further. Again, second fort probably not in the cards. But just getting the wall, just doing a little bit more damage in general is going to be absolutely sweet for them. So, so far so good. Okay, Banana Age. Yeah. The turn in again. We got the gems. Definitely do. Second turn in. More or less confirmed. John, though. Oh, that's a kill. No, oh, he gets saved. <laughs> Spreads the love a little bit with the living bombs, but Johan is still alive. Garrosh did not die. Instead, Sven gets attacked again. But is able to get out. At least this time he didn't fall. But we have the next engage happening as Banana H is making a move. He's sitting on 30,000 damage with Tracer. Captain Rex zipping around. Johan soaking all the damage. Like, he's a damage sponge. I mean, he really is. Time and time again, he gets attacked here and just soaks up the damage like there's no tomorrow. Now another flip and another kill. This is the fifth time now that Sven died. Captain, my captain, what's going on? I mean, he is baiting out that damage like a boss, but he's also dying in the process. Now, Leo responding on point is obviously nice, but it's really starting to take a bit of a toll to the team. Ten kills to six. The blue team is turning in again. Sven is just acting as a mobile observer ward in this game. <laughs> I mean, he's granting a lot of vision. You gotta give him that. Not too bad. This is what we call a legal map hack. He's just ghosting around here, and yeah, that's that. Blue Webbyverse coming down again. This is, of course, the moment where you want to get at least this. Ah, good. Tomb, is it good enough to get a kill? Bunker. Bunker saves the day, and everybody is forced back. Johan still alive. Garrosh died three times in total, but he is still able to do tons of work here. And they're pushing everybody back. The bottom of the map is exposed. That fort will likely fall to the Webweavers alone. And in the middle, we have Banana Age and his boys pushing for glory once more with level 16 talents that they already hold. And here comes the stun from the arrow. They got unleashed by Nano. But he is still a bit low, has to be healed up by Lucio. And this wall in the middle is open up. Even the Keeper's taking some damage now. And the bot lane fort, as expected, is falling. So, that's that. There we go. And all the way up at the top, they can burn through the wall too. Yeah, Team Banana Age is currently running the show here. They are definitely calling the shots. It might be 16 versus 16 now. Mithril Maze is in. But generally speaking, it is the blue team that sets the agenda. And is making their plays. So, off we go. We got also Epic Enter for Nuborak. So they can epically enter these team fights from here on out. Still trying to make his move. They're defending as best as they can. Objective is up once again. Ready for turn in in two more seconds. And the red team has enough gems to make it happen. Blue team isn't that far behind, by the way. 44 gems in the hands of Team Sven and 46 in the hands of Team Banana Age, which is not that bad. I mean, honestly, they are pretty close to another turn in, too. If they can safeguard those gems and turn them in, that would be big. Yeah, 10 kills to 6. Another 16. And they're still dancing around the two turn-in points. Not allowing the red team to get anything done without having to fight for it. 52 Ted gems now. 20 on Kalthas. So, yeah, they're holding a lot there. And when we're talking Leoric at the bottom of the map, he's on 14. So Sven is currently missing. He's uh, pushing the bot lane out. The rest of the team is busy in the middle of the map. Here's the turn-in from Johan. So they're at least trying to save some of their gems as they're all moving in. Specifically, Blaze is going to try and make that work. He's on 23, so if he can turn in, that would be great. Alright, and he's able to pull it off. And now with Itrax turning in, they would be sitting at 50. Arrow missing completely. They go for Garrow. She dies. Didn't even get stunned out, but still falls. Zoning Arrow, clearly. Zoning Garrosh out right into the path of the incoming damage. Exactly as Nano planned it. That was the plan all along. It was a ruse. 
Now the turn -in is completed and the red team is getting their web weavers. So, nicely done. Now, all the way up at the top, we got Sven doing his thing. We currently have 18 to 18 on the level count. 10 kills to 7. And down at the bottom of the map, yep, another fort is about to fall. So the red team is already gaining a bit of momentum here, which was desperately needed. Top side, they attempt the defense without Garrosh as they're pushing the lane out a little bit and the Webweavers on top of that as well, of course. But here comes the next move around from the bot lane as they're starting to push the blue team back, forcing them to defend. Web Weavers at the bottom of the map are actually fairly close to the wall and will very quickly start doing damage there. But all the way up at the top, Lucio <laughs> trying to catch him here, but not quite able to pull it off. All right, Milaiki, let's see what they can do. This is the moment. This is the moment where Team Sven can bring it back. They were struggling in the mid game a bit. Now it's level 19 versus level 19, and they have a chance. Their first Web Weaver push was amazing, thanks to the triple kill from Nano. Now they're trying again at the top. They keep taking some damage, but definitely not enough. Good defense at the bottom of the map already from Fancy Pants. And here in the middle of the map, he is now burning down the next Web Weaver set. So job well done by him. Nicely done. So, with that, we now have the next little play happening in the middle as the blue team is now going to try for the turn in. It was a decent defense by them. Didn't lose too much. Teams are both fighting for 20, but he has still an attempt to go for, ah, for Garrosh. And he escaped through the bunker once more. So Sven hits the Entomb. Would have been even better if they already had level 20. I guess it wouldn't have made that big of a difference because the bunker would have been placed one way or another. But he has 33 gems, so he really wants to turn in. And he is going to be able to deliver. That's important. Sven is now ready to uh, use his trait again. <laughs> and there are the Storm Talons. Okay, immediately an attempt to force a fight. I mean, right away, they hit level 20, and they're rushing in and trying to make their move. There's the turn in. Blue team with their own set of web weavers now that we have the upgraded in Tomb for Leoric. We also have Rewind for uh, Nubarak and Flamethrower for Kalthas. So, let's get that range in. Kalthas with 30,000 damage. We have 53,000 from Hanzo. He's the only one on the red team that has not died yet. I feel a bit sorry for the web weaver over here. That web weaver is just pissed. Can you imagine being spawned as a web weaver and then you have to start over all the way on the other side of the map and you're like, oh, really? I gotta walk all the way down there? That's my invitation of an American web weaver, by the way. So, yeah. Walking? Does somebody have a car? Seriously, a car, anything. Anything. Guys, please, please. Something that allow, like, any, anything, a car, a truck. No, I gotta walk this for sure. And Nuburak down, the Web Weaver still walking, at least gonna hit a fort soon. But here in the middle it's all about the keep and that kill against the Nuburak might allow them to go for it. But yep, top side Web Weaver is finally there, is already super exhausted because they walk half the map. So here's the fort, about to be destroyed, keep is already gone. 11 kills to 7 and yep, pretty successful push. Probably hoping for a bit more than that even. But still, able to take a keep down, able to take a four down, the last one. So, a slight advantage now for Team Banana Age when it comes to uh, the situation in the game. And we're still on map number one. We have 58,000 damage from Junkrat. Tracer on 53,000 has now been relieved from her position as top damage Sheila in the game. She is currently taking third place after Junkrat and uh, Hanzo. The two of them battling it out for uh, top damage. And here's the turn in attempt now from the red team, but it's of course the traditional trade that we're seeing also often on this map. The boss gets claimed by team Banana H, and at the bottom of the map they're trying to turn in one gem short as they get interrupted. Yeah, trying to go for Garrosh. Johan nearly getting killed there, but they're able to keep him alive. Now the boss gets claimed, and we don't have the trade. We actually do not have the trade. So, normally what you see happening there is one team goes for boss, the other team turns their gems in, and then it's a defense, where both teams just decide to defend, and it's an exchange of gems against the boss defense. But now that they were able to interrupt that multiple times, they can push for the next keep. They already have done some damage at the bottom. Now they're coming in here. They go for Malfurion, and he gets saved by Garrosh. And instead, Lucio dies. Beautiful save by Garrosh, and Lucio gets killed in the process. That one was pretty big. Really nice move 
from Garrosh, that would have been the end of Malfury and very easily. And instead what happens is that they get the support killed on the other side. Big and two men kill. They take Hans out. Garrosh dies. The core is getting attacked. Anubarak falls. They go for Leo next. He gets murdered too. And this is four heroes now barreling down on the core with the help of the boss. And big, big plays by Team Banana Age as they are about to lock in the lead in the best of three series here at Banshee Cup season number two. Nicely done, Banana Age and his team with a victory. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Game number two, Aldrich Pass, Team Banana Age here on Playday number five, again doing work. Now, given the track record of the blue team, I think personally this would be the perfect opportunity to start with some bounty quests. Because not only has Banana Age's team not lost a single series so far, they are now also in the lead on in this best of three. So if at any point this team was thinking about completing some bounties, this would be the moment. Now, we can always argue about what would that bounty be. It's Aldrich Pass, it's a big map. Do you go for Nidus Zagara, Longboat Vikings, Hunt Illidan? I mean, there's options here. There's definitely options that they could play with this. If they're doing it, that's a different question, but I would say that this is a perfect opportunity to try and bust out some bounties because you are fairly safe in the standings with how many matches you've already won. I mean, obviously you still want to establish yourself as the number one spot, but given that this is the best of three series and you're ahead, there is a chance. We could see it. Sylvanas gets banned, Samuro gets banned. Team Sven, of course, they have to try and bring this back here. And Sven's team, this is actually the map where the last time, or I believe the last time, they played, or they tried to play with Kelthas and the Convection. So, uh, Dehaka gets banned. Obviously, Kelthas can't be played again. He has already been played in the series, so the same draft rule is still maintained throughout the tournament as we had in Banshee Cup Season number 1. Heroes can only be played once. It creates a little bit more hero diversity. Hogger gets locked in very quickly, though. And here we go with Brightwing and with Diablo. So the Fruit Fly is in. Triple Healer could be a thing. Banana Age busting out his Vala. And then they go for Triple Heal. Brightwing as one of the supports getting Rega out with Bloodlust. I mean, we had Triple Heal attempts already uh, in this tournament. So wasn't successful, but hey. Johan, uh, well, Johan with Diablo, Johanna with, uh, with, uh, Arian with Johanna. <laughs> that is never not gonna confuse me. Especially since he calls himself Johan Ayaya, so there's an A uh, right behind it. And, yeah. So they play Sergeant Hammer. Perfect opportunity now to go for Knight of Zigara and just play around them. Just play the macro game. If you don't go for a bounty here, then I don't know when they ever will go for a bounty. I gotta say. So... Yeah. Okay, so... Let's let, let, let's see what they're gonna pull off. I mean, again, maybe they're just gonna go for a quick victory here. Not even... Try a bounty. But if they wanna have their share of the bounty pool, this would be a good opportunity for B Team Banana Age to actually make a move for it. Here comes Genji. I mean, there's some teams that are actually practicing in scrim specifically also for bounties, so we could see that. I don't know if they are one of them. Fancy Pants obviously uh, drafting for them right now as they kept them. So time will tell what they can pull off. Well, the draft will tell. He has the chance to show us already the direction this is going. You know, they're busting out Chogal. I don't think so. Falstead and Sonia. Which essentially means the Zagara Nidus dream is still a thing. Zagara Nidus, Brightwing and Falstead going for the pseudo triple global to out rotate Sergeant Hammer. IQ 200, right there. But the final two picks for the red team, they are playing obviously a hammer comp here. So they still need to protect the Sergeant a bit. And that's going to be done with Anduin to pull Sergeant Emma out whenever they can. And with Greymane, so essentially they can also push on two lanes now if they wanted to. 
that leaves us with the final choice for Team Banana Age. And the moment of truth on Alarak Pass. As they are revealing that they are going to play this with... Cooldown. Sad. Just sad. Don't know what else to say here. Alderac Pass, game number two. Banana H against Sven. Let's go. Game number two. Team Banana H in the lead and still not going for a bounty. Proving once again that the French just don't like fun. Well, we know that in Europe it is the Germans that are the most fun-loving people. So the French here are just proving again that they don't have a sense of humor, that they don't want to do anything, you know, that breaks the mold a little bit. And they are sticking to the rules. So, yeah, the French is right now not trying anything with bounties. We have Banana Age on Falstead. We got Jean LaSalle on Brightwing. We got Fancy Pants playing on the account Okmek with Sonia. Atrex on Gul'dan and Johan is playing Diablo. Oh, yeah, yeah. On the right side of the map, Nano with Sergeant Hammer, Sven on Hogger, we got Captain Rex on Anduin, Ether on Greymane, and Arion is playing Johanna. So, let's go. Let's see what they can pull off. The Sergeant here with the advanced artillery as his level 1 talent. There's a party happening here in the middle of the map right away. And off we go. Top side. That's where we got Nano, slowly firing away. <laughs> Riveting Sergeant Hammer play. Look at this. Like a boss. One order attack after another. Ah. <laughs> well, Hammer can... I, I, I kind of don't know what it is for Sergeant Hammer. But on the one hand, Sergeant Hammer is kind of interesting to watch. Because you always feel, you know, that the teams have to just break through the siege. And then again, Sergeant Hammer is just one of the most boring characters in the entire game. Just like sitting here and pew, pew, pew. <laughs> Specifically in the early stages when he can't even move her. So, yeah. Just one shot after another. Nano is trying to now pull it off, but down at the bottom of the map, the birdie gets attacked. Banana H is currently playing Falstead himself. Has been crushing it with Tracer, obviously, on the last map. And now trying to follow up on that. They got two globals, so they can play around the opponent a little bit and start to make their plays here. As the top lane gets pressured once again. Yep, Itrex gets attacked down at the bottom. Banana Age going up against Sven, obviously attempting to leverage his range as best he can. And is also greeting a little bit of a kill that he couldn't get yet. And in the mid lane, we see a similar play happening. This is a three versus three. The tanks all dancing around each other here, trying to push it out. Level 4 kicks in. Hogger now with the Hogger's Joggers and on the foul. Alright. I honestly wonder if anybody just named their dog Hogger. <laughs> Probably exists. <laughs> uh, can you imagine having like a, some like shitty handbag dog, like a Chihuahua or something, and calling it Hogger? <laughs> Now, to be fair, that's not really a dog. Like, all of these handbag thingies, that they are basically rats in disguise. Rats that have been fooling humans into uh, making them believe that they are actual dogs. And yeah, so an actual dog starts roughly at knee height. In case you weren't aware of it. Big push at the bottom of the map. Same is happening at the top. So both of them are pushing. Ooh, such a hammer. And yeah, that is the problem when you're going up against Anduin. You're making a play and you're finally getting a hold of a hero that you were aiming for the entire time. Then Hogger, uh, sorry, Anduin comes in. And just pulls the target out. Super easily, right there. And, yeah. Kind of unfortunate. Anyways. Zero kills so far. We have 13 stacks on Gul'dan. And for Grey main again, eyes in the dark. So, topside. Nano. Reliably with one order attack after another. Keeping the opposition at bay here. As Diablo in the middle is getting attacked very quickly. So, off we go. And, yeah, we still got not a single kill in the game. A bit more cautious now on the side of Team Sven. I miss the time when Sven was just busting out his Samuro over and over again. I'm honestly a bit saddened that we haven't seen that yet here in Banshee Cup Season number 2 from him. It would be pretty amazing. 
But yeah, malevolence now for Diablo. By giving him a secret weapon for for Falstead. And they're still pushing against Sergeant Hammer, who now finally has mobility with the hover siege mode. Which again should still be baseline. You should just unlock that talent on level seven. Or something else. Because or you should just like add some like give it yeah, just change the level 7 talents completely, remove the ones that we have right now, make Hover Siege mode baseline, maybe like a little bit of a malice there, and then with the other, with the new 3 talents can do something, but it is just necessary. If you're playing Sergeant Hammer to win the game on any high level, then this is just mandatory. There are a couple of people that are always making, you're like, no, but you could play with graduating range, and the answer is just no. Just no. It's just no. If you're trying to win the video game, you have to play Hover Siege mode. That is, it's just mandatory. They did the same thing with other talents in the past, where they just said, yeah, this talent is too impactful for the hero. And with Sergeant Hammer, it's just the same. Graduating range is just nowhere near the benefit that you're getting from Hover Siege mode when we're talking about any decent level of play. I mean, if you're playing in Plastic or Wood League, then obviously you can get away with just anything. But yeah, we're talking about actual moments here. Either way. Uh, we're not getting any kind of balance patch, a proper balance patch anytime soon anyway, so <laughs> no need even debating this. So we got level 9 in, they're denying the objective for now, chasing Diablo a bit as well. Teams are of course hoping for a quick level 10 right now, as Gul'dan is sitting at 21 stacks on his level 1. And here is the counterplay attempt, as the red team is aiming for an objective, and you know what? They're actually getting pretty close to this. Level 10 isn't ready for the blue team, and apparently they're not trying to fight yet. They're just giving it up. Nani? 10 seconds? I don't think they got enough time. They're moving in now. There's Leap for Anduin. Leap into Apocalypse. And Anduin is finally getting killed? I don't think so. The objective is about to be taken. Anduin dies. I would sacrifice Anduin for this as well. If you sacrifice anything on their team, I would sacrifice Anduin too. I mean, look at and look at the red team and tell me another hero you would like to sacrifice. I go Anduin 10 out of 10 times, 100%. So, totally worth it. Nicely done. Yes, there is level 10 now in hands of both teams as Team Sven gets their own. That gives us a Shockwave and also the Blessed Shield. So now we have two stuns that you can chain if you want to. But having the Raiders here is absolutely awesome. Yep, that's pretty cool. So let's go. Let's try and make a move and see if they can maybe even take one of the forts out. I doubt it a bit. I think that walls is the only thing that they can really go for. But as they're sieging up in the middle, they might be able to pull at least some damage off. There's no Abatha involved this time on all drag pass. That means that there, nothing can be repaired here. There's no mule. Abatha is the last one that maintained mule. Everybody else lost it. Tyrande had it in the past. Malfurion had it. A few other supports as well, but it all got taken away from them. So I have only Abathur as a mule. Blessed shield! And the hits, the stuns, the kills. Right wing down. Gul'dan is down. They're losing Jana though, as Falster comes in from behind. So at least the counter kill. But with the fort being destroyed, the death is definitely worth it. So, very well done. Nicely played. And a pretty cool move right there. They're trying to go for Diablo, who pushes his way back out. But even with the gust and the kill that was set up by Banana H on Falstead, this is worth it. Two for one trade, and then on top of that, you are getting also a fort destroyed. That is pretty neat. Now all the way up at the top, what we're getting in the meantime is an easy move here with Ether as they're pushing the next lane out. Idea, of course, always being to hopefully use the minions to push some of these lanes down like that. And, well, down at the bottom of the map now, we're having the next move being made with level 13 up on the horizon next. So, there it is. Now, Ogmek gets attacked, aka Fancy Pants again is playing the account on the European server here, obviously also playing with a bit of a, a ping malice, playing cross server. And all the way up at the top with Greymane being uh, safeguarded by Jojo. They go for the kill, nice! I was honestly just expecting <laughs> Johanna is dead. And that little play might give them... <laughs> he jumps on top of him and kills Greymane. There we go. Job well done. Really sweet move. Forrester with a double kill, killing Jojo. Banana H absolutely murdering them. That was sexy as hell. Gusting them in, and that, uh, that was just perfect. <laughs> Flying on top of Greymane. 
knew obviously perfectly from where he was trying to escape, and that's a kill there. Beautiful play. Banana Age very quickly making an impact in game number two. Four kills to four now. They lose Diablo. Are close to losing Fancy Pants on Sonya as well. But that was pretty sweet. Yeah, nicely done. Four kills to four. We have them with a really good spot. Just in general. Talk mainly about Team Svenja. I mean, to be fair, the kill was, of course, super flashy. And Banana H has made some amazing plays. He got the double kill at the top right now. Granted, with the help of the fort, he earlier uh, supplied the, uh, the angle of the gust in the middle that allowed them to take Johanna down too. But while they have some really nice kills, the fact remains that they have lost two of their forts. So two of their forts are now gone. And that sets them back quite a bit. Even experience, but the passive experience crease for Team Sven has now been pretty sweet. We have Falster double checking also at the boss towards the top, and at the bottom of the map, the red team is now slowly making a move for the first boss of the game. Sven can easily get some assistance from Greymane as they can start to make their move here, but that would allow them to maybe even get some damage in on the key. They're not a they're going to be able to take the entire thing down or anything like it. But just getting the boss and then pushing in would already help a lot. The counter play from the blue team is to go for a boss at the top side. That will probably take the fort out. It's a slightly inexperienced now too for Team Sven, which allows them to grab the early level 16. But the situation on the map, just generally speaking, is still advantageous for the red team. Specifically since they're pushing through the bottom of the map now and are trying to take the objective at the same time. So, yeah, there it is. So already starting to move in with it, all the way up at the top, we're having uh, the boss move in. That fort is going to get destroyed, but with the objective about to lock in, I don't even know if they're going to try and make a play for that. They grab this too, it seems like they can. And they basically just have one attack after another coming through, it's just like one pressure play after the next. Yeah, and there we go. They're going to get this one. I don't think anybody is going to push in that aggressively to stop it. Yeah, Sonya was maybe trying for a moment there. Leap into Apocalypse. They did it again. Can they get a kill? Blue team is about to lose Sonya if they're not careful. And they all got a retreat. Yep, unfortunate for them. There were a couple of stuns that came out. Blessed Shield was nicely connected. They missed out on Hogger's Shockwave though. Sonya was just leaping away from it. And now the objective comes in. Top side is being defeated, of course. So the boss went through the wall and opened up a pathway to the keep. But the red team is aggressively pushing from the middle. And with Ether, once the Greyman goes into Wargan form, they can do some serious work there as well. So that's exactly what's going on right now. We got level 17 coming up next for the teams here. So again, high level and experience. Just a quick look at experience in general as ah, Gul'dan gets attacked and killed. Diablo becomes the next target. Team Sven is looking so much better now in game number two. We get the fancy plays from Banana Age and specifically Falstead, but it is the blue team that is suffering loss after loss. They lost the forts, now they're losing the first keep. Bottom of the map, Banana Age is still trying to defend here as the rest of the team is rotating back down. There's only three defenders left and Sonya, for example, has Lee, but she doesn't have the sustain, doesn't have the survivability that she needs here. Blessed Shield comes out and this time Falstead gets murdered. Leap comes in, but only slows things down, and this is going to be a second heat that gets destroyed by Team Sven. Two armor shields removed on the core, and that is exactly what you're looking for if you are trying to end the game on uh, uh, Albright Pass. Once that you have two armor shields removed, you can make those plays for the core. Before that, it's oftentimes a bit too risky. We've seen a few games where teams were able to take a core down when it still had two armor shields remaining, but they are very, very rare. Most of the time it backfires and then you get killed. Anduin again, pulling the targets out. Diablo came back and immediately died again, so he is gone. Fallset isn't here yet, has gas, but they're pushing now to the top. Trying to even damage the final remaining keep. The leading experience has been extended to all the trump cards now in the hands of Team Sven. 57,000 damage for Sergeant Hammer and just look at the amount of damage here. With Falstead back, they know that Banana H might make a fly for a gust, but they're just letting this keep get destroyed. And that means that without a single armor shield on the core remaining, even the minion waves now become a huge problem. Even the minion waves become a huge issue from here on out. This is nearly impossible to recover from. 
If Banana Age and his team can recover from that spot in the game, that would be more than impressive. But highly unlikely. Team Sven would have to int massively in order for that to Okay, maybe it's maybe it's still possible. Now that I think about it, yeah, maybe it's still possible. <laughs> but yeah, unless Team Sven ints, they should have this one in the back. They still have two forts, they have all their keeps. They destroyed every single structure with the exception of the core. Just slowing the game down, waiting for level 20, and then do your thing should be enough in order to win it. Bot lane, top lane are already pushing towards the core. The lanes are doing work. Now we have the quest completed for Gul'dan. Maybe a bit late considering that they're already on level 20, but on the other hand, we're only 14 minutes in. Isolation gust attempt against Ether. Diablo with the engage, and there's the kill. Falstead is gone. The birdie is back in the KFC bucket. Chicken wings for dinner as they're starting to chase Sonya over on the right side. Sonya gets chased around. They're chasing in the middle, trying to also take, of course, the camp out. Gul'dan is dealing with a wave at the top, but Sonya is about to get murdered here. Fancy pants destroyed, and now they can go for the objective. They can go for the core directly. They can go for the boss, and that seems to be the decision that's made here. Only two seconds left before it's back up, and then, of course, a push straight up for the core. Yeah, nicely done. Really good performance by Team Sven in game number two of the series. Struggling a lot more on the first map, but here they're crushing it. Despite the nice plays that we've seen from Banana Age specifically, but defending against this, nearly impossible. Boss is up. Kua has already taken some damage, and again, the big point is no shields left. No shields, and now they can make their move. With Sonya still missing for another 20 seconds, they try to go for Diablo, and Tibbles with a Hellgate, trying to go for a kill on Grey Man, can't get it. Oh, and even the save on Sven, damn. Hogger was so close to dying. They steal the camp away. Gul'dan was hoping for a Horn Connect and couldn't even get that. So now we have 10 kills to four, and they're starting to make the move. It's just too much. Apocalypse gets used. They're hoping for quick kills. They need them. Greater from Sonya only traps herself with Sergeant Hammer. That's a kill, that's a double. Dibbles down, Sonya is dead. Falstead is flying and kills Sergeant Hammer, but I do not think it's gonna be enough, specifically since Gul'dan and Falstead have now both been obliterated. Diablo is next up on the list. The core about to fall, and that is a tie in the series. We're going to game number three between Team Banana H and Team Sven on this fifth play day of Banshee Cup season number two. GG! And well played. Game number three, Garden of Terror. So let's go. Team Sven taking a map off Team Banana Age. Again, blue team has not lost the series thus far. They came Actually, a lot of times they were forced into game number three. This is another example of it happening. The question remains, of course, can Team Sven now be the first team that comes in and takes them out? So we'll see if they're able to pull that off. Right now, we got Banana H and his boys with a quick ban on Samura. That is already... Uh, come on. I was talking in game number two about how I really hoped that Sven would bust out his Samura again. And this would be another map where that's an option, but now it gets banned out. So, yeah, Team Banana H, they're channeling their inner German. No fun allowed in this series, apparently. Kinda sad. Kinda sad. But yeah, what exactly is Sven and his boys, what are they doing here now? They force game number three, they won on all direct pass, it's another big map. And noteworthy that they chose the map. So, it was Team Banana H that went for first pick, first ban. And now we have Sven deciding in favor of Garden of Terror. Which, when you think about it, after Alarak Pass, which was a big map, is now the second big map in the series. They lost on Tomb of the Spider Queen, which is a lot smaller and therefore just like facilitates a lot more fights and uh, snowball potential here. But let's see what they can bust out on another big map. If you're gonna get some sneaky plays by either one of the teams, that would be pretty sweet. But yeah. Either way, ban on Sylvanas. So, no Sylvanas in this game. And first pick, let's go. Banana Age. He, by the way, played a fantastic false set. His false set was just mean as hell. 
Now he got, of course, targeted then towards the end and also killed a few times, but just generally speaking, he's been doing an absolute stunning job on all direct pass. It wasn't enough to win them the game, but still some sexy plays. That fly kill onto Greymane in particular was pretty awesome. Was really sweet. So we get Chromie as a very early pick here from Itrax. And yeah, <laughs> death from above, just from a distance to keep the barrage coming. I still love the days. I, I, I remember when Chromie was played in HTC quite a bit, and one of the things that Breeze did at some point to just shut her down continuously was pick Muradin with Skullcracker, and he always just kept jumping on Chromie and attacking and attacking her, and Chromie just did nothing throughout the entire game. Aria now with Muradin. I'm just waiting for the same kind of play right there. But I still remember that because Chromie at the time was a huge problem and a lot of teams had trouble dealing with her. And then Breeze was just like, okay, what if I just attack her the entire time and stun her out with Skullcracker, played Muradin and just kept going for her. And Chromie very quickly, I don't want to say disappeared, but got taken down a notch. Which is tough because she's already uh, like low enough as is, but hey, that's just what it is. Urel on side lane, and we get Varian. Now, of course, the big twist that could now come from Team Banana Age is that they are not playing Varian as a main tank. Uh -uh. They're going to pick another main tank, play Varian on the side lane, go for meme blades, and go for the bounty. Nah, I'm just kidding. That's never going to happen. I, I don't think that a team is going to go for meme blades anytime soon. It's a nice and juicy bounty over there, but I don't think that anybody is really going to do that. Only plastic players are going for meme blades. I would love the attempt though. The attempt would be funny. But if any team does it, I would love it even more if they would throw an Abyssai into the mix, for example, as well, and just go a full machine gun attack. Vikings get banned. Further confirming my suspicion that Team Banana Age just hates fun with a passion. So on the red team side, we are going for what now exactly? Is Muradin and Genji? Gaslo! Okay, we're going for a Gaslo bounty. Team Sven, they've proven in previous series that they are always game for a bounty attempt and they're doing it again here. So Gaslo bounty it is everybody. And we get Rhaegar as their heal. <laughs> I like that. We already had a Gaslo bounty completed. Dequaza has actually won a game with Gazlo, so yes, they have completed that bounty once. Now it could be Team Sven that does the same. We get White Mane and we get Cassia, and that leaves us with the final pick with Ether for Garden of Terror. Gazlo, of course, also pretty sweet if he can just go for mercenary camps over and over again and make his play there. And our final pick should probably need them with uh, well, another melee hero that can also dish out a bit of damage, might be nice for them. Let's see how exactly they are going to try and play it here. But on Guard of Terror, Team Sven on the final map, they go for Zagara. Zagara! Now, you cannot complete two bounties in the same game. If Zagara goes Nidus here, then they have and they win the game, they have to choose which bounty they want to complete. Gaslow, Gravel Bomb after a more engage. Just saying. So either way, guys, Guard of Terror, let's go, Team Sven against Team Banana H. Game number three, Team Banana H on the left side of the map with Banana on Chromie, Itrax on Cassia, we got Fancy Pants on the account Okmek, playing Urel, Jean LaSalle on White Main, and Johan with Varian. On the right side of the map, it's Team Sven with the man himself on Gazlo, so he is following in the footsteps of Dequaza, trying to complete the bounty for his team. Captain Rex is playing Rega, we got Ether on Zagara. Still the chance to go for Nidus on level 10, but I really doubt that they're going to do that. I think they're going to chain some of the AoE talents here. We have Arian on Muradin and Nano on Genji. Well, and with everybody back to business, after a quick pause was called on the side of Team Sven, and we're now going to check out if Gazlo can win another game. It's highly likely that they're going to try and play Zagara with more, get those hits in, use the AoE stun from Gazlo, and then maybe even chain it with another AoE ability here, going for the Gravel Bomb, for example. So uh, we'll see if they can pull any of this off. But for now, what we're getting is stacks for Cassia. Oh, ho, 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 ho. and we get the High King's quest for Varian. 
Okay, <laughs> that took an interesting turn. High King's Quest on level 1 for Varian. I am a bit intrigued. It would be kind of fun if they would try to go for a bounty as well, because then uh, no matter what happens in this game, a bounty would be completed. So, uh, Johan at the front with the High King's Quest now. That normally indicates that you have at least thought about going away from Taunt. Now, normally when that happens, we are of course getting Smash. That basically... How many times get Smash actually played? One in a hundred variant games is probably even being generous. But it would be just fantastic if you would deviate away from it. Just for the means, obviously. Taunt is by far the strongest talent for him, specifically when you play him in a main tank role, and that's clearly what we're seeing here for Varian. We get stacks for Cassia, as I already indicated, with Thunderstroke as the level 1 talent. And we are off to the races. Gazlo is all the way up at the top. Soon gonna start going for camps, I suppose. And gets quickly knocked senseless as the blue team is starting to go for camps. So, let's get the party started. It's game number three. Whoever wins this one takes the series. And it will answer the question whether or not Team Banana Age can stay undefeated. When it comes to matches. Zagara with a bit more creep already being spread on the map. Muradin has to jump out. We cannot really invade the camp as the blue team is committed with five players to lock this in. That allows for a bit more time for Gazlo and now Rega at the top as the two of them are starting to push for structures. And they're actually getting some damage in. Yeah, that's not too shabby. Look at this. While the rotation is coming, they're doing well. They should probably start retreating now, but they're getting one tower. They're getting more than that. But they are very, very late to react to the rotation, and they are likely going to lose the hero here. No, maybe not. Varian, where's his ult? Yeah, doesn't get his level 4. Chromie instead falls at the bottom of the map, up at the top, therefore. A lot of success, and Varian still going for taunt, even with the Hiking's Quest on level 1. So it's a taunt master over here. And Zagara now going up against the camp, but initially at least a decent start for the red team. Sven and his boys are taking a half level lead, have done damage at the top side wall. We now have Zagara with the envenomed spines and Gazlo with a rocket socket after he went for the rocket boots on level 1. So, Anduin is already excited because he just heard boots and he's like, wait, 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 wait. There's other boots than the lion speed boot thingies? Fantastic! Anduin is all about the boots. Even when he's not in the game, he's always looking out for the new fashion trends. That's just the guy that he is. And he heard boots, so he was already in it. Anyways, um, with that now being taken, we have also the Mobius loop in. 17 stacks for... Oh, 17 stacks for Cassia. Not bad. Rega getting attacked, but is able to get away from this. And Zagara just continuing to spread creeps so that she gets a little bit more vision on the map as well. And we have the next camp already about to be taken by Nano and by Captain Rex. So, I'm definitely, I'm game for this. I mean, Gazlo seeing him at the top lane is just funny as hell already. And the wave clear is certainly there. The level 7 talents are now kicking in. And I just can't wait for rogue abilities to see what exactly their combo is going to look like for Team Sven. Because this is likely what we're going to get from the red team. They're yeah, pressuring with Zagara at the bottom of the map. Gazlo pushes up at the top. And he's done even more damage there as we speak. The whole idea of the blue team, of course, being taunt into damage from Chromie and from Cassia. So let's see if they can do that. We have with level 7 now intercession kicking in. We're getting the second win at the same time for Varian. 19 stacks for Cassia. At 4 minute mark again. She's currently on track for a decent move. And up at the top. Sven still completely soloing this. Sven for the Goblin Fusion for a bit more scrap here. Trying to deal with those Siege Giants as the first seed is now finally about to be channeled. The taunt against Genji and he gets out. Muradin jumping in and immediately trying to interrupt the damage from behind. Ether now also in position. <laughs> and there's the hit right there. Nicely done, Gromi with all that burst damage to take down Zagara and capitalize on her low hit point pool. Rega gets killed too, but the blue team, the blue team committed with five heroes, which means that at the top, Gazler is now doing damage to the actual fort. Now he cannot overstay too much longer because there could be more heroes rotating over than just simply uh, Urel. But that's some easy damage already. Varian is now slowly coming in. Yeah, and with a taunt, Sven, again, he needs to be careful. Taunt is in, and I think that's the end of, of Gazlo. It's a bit unfortunate for Sven, but that was telegraphed. That was absolutely telegraphed. 
Saw that one coming from a mile away. He just stayed too long. It's still wasting that time, but eventually he falls. He did damage to the fort, but I think he could have just fallen back a little bit earlier than that. Either way, Rega can now take over. Muradin is already sitting there at the side doing his flank thing. And just welcomes Jean Lasalle with a quick Skullcracker here. Level 10 is now inching closer and closer, and it's going to be the moment of truth for Team Sven. So, how are they going to play it? Stormbolt after the taunt. There it is. Maw is taken, and the Robo Goblin. Okay, no massive Bombo attempts with a Gravel Bomb, but we got Maw into Robo Goblin from the red team. Over on the left side, Cassia is the only one that hasn't made a choice yet. Everybody else is already good to go. And Gazlo now with Robo Goblin is already starting to make his big plays right here. Starting to go for camps. Again, I have talked in the past a lot about how Garden of Terror is like all about camp pressure. If you can get camps quickly, if you have that clear, then you find yourself in a really, really nice spot applying pressure to the opponent. Zagara is in a good spot for that. Genji is obviously moving around a lot to try and use mobility as an advantage. And then you have Gazlo. Very nice move here too. That was actually pretty sweet. That was really weird as well because Chromie had a say in that play too. So initially it was just Valkyrie being used after a taunt, but Chromie also used her loop. So that kind of saved Rhaegar. I mean, it did and it didn't because Ancestor was already used, but keep keep a look on, on Rhaegar here. So he gets, first of all, hit by the ult on, uh, on Cassia, but the loop was already called, so he gets looped back out of the situation by Chromie. So definitely in the communication, not 100%. I don't think it would have mattered because he used Ancestral immediately. But now Cassia gets killed here down at the bottom of the map. We had three kills to two in total and Gaslo is still applying pressure at the top as the red team is hoping for even more damage down bot lane. So they might be behind in kills, but they are the ones applying pressure consistently here. And Urel is having some problems. Fancy Pants is sitting there and has struggling keeping up with Gazlo as he's just pushing these lanes out. So down at the bottom of the map, we're currently looking at another seat about to be claimed. It seems like Team Sven is going to be the one to walk away with the lead and threatening to grab the first Garden Terrors of the game. Yeah, Nano takes it easily. And Gazlo is now quickly rotating back out to the next camp to grab the Siege Giants here. Not too bad. So, with that said and done, we're now having uh, the neck. Ooh, Urel coming in. She's not alone. They're stealing the camp. They're trying to at least. Genji could help out. Rega is moving in, but they're too late to do anything about it. Really good timing from Team Banana H. They're invading the camp. They're claiming it quickly. So that's a nice little W for them right here. Down to the bottom of the map in the meantime, we still have a potential play from Zagara. She can try to use the absence of any blue team player to go for the fort and even get those Siege Giants escorted in. So yeah, Zagara gets the damage done, has to retreat. Muradin is keeping an eye on the movements of the opponent's team though. And that's some really neat free damage. Look how quickly that fort goes down. So a huge amount of damage against the bottom forward from Team Sven simply because of the rotational play that they just made. And they're basically getting the entire thing. They're getting it. The Winion with a final arrow is able to claim the fort. Fort gets destroyed. First structure obliterated. Yeah, Muradin jumps out. Got looped back in. Nice damage. Has the avatar up and now they can go for Chromie. Banana Age is in trouble. He's still alive thanks to White Mane and Muradin is desperately trying to escape. But that also means that the topside duo Gazlo Rega can go for Ford and takes it out. Chromie was attacked again by Genji. He couldn't get the kill. But that's two Fords now gone. So really nice damage output on the side of Team Sven when it comes to the structural plays that they're making. They're taking White Mane out. They go again for Chromie. She goes for the timeout and saves herself here. But just look at that pressure. Team Sven, that Gazlo Zagara comp that they're running here is just murderous. Varian goes down, doesn't stand a prayer here. And they're just killing it, absolutely killing it. Going for the fort in the middle as it is the final one. They have now four kills to three and a one level lead. And with two heroes dead on the blue team side, the chance to go for the first set of Garden Terrors. And that's exactly what they're getting. They've won another kill and they get it. Cassia is gone. Cassia is dead. Staggered death against Team Banana Age. And Team Sven is looking spectacular here. They're looking so damn good. 
Yeah, pushing, 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 making the big plays with the Zagara, with Gaslow, escorting those Garden Terrors over. Another fort falls. That's the entire outer ring of defense already gone, whereas Team Sven hasn't lost a single fort themselves yet. And topside, Zagara is just pushing the Web Weavers, uh, the Web Weavers, the Garden Terrors in. Same shit at the end of the day. So yeah, pushes it in. They are starting to go for it. Here comes the fight. Quick timeout as well. Level 16 talents are available now. The Maw is ready. They go for Johan. And he's alive. Ancestral healing came out. They're doing the best they can. But now there's Garden Terrors knocking at the walls at the top in the bot lane. In the middle, they're still going for damage. And they're starting to take the heroes low too. Garden Terror still alive as they're poking as best they can. Johan is moving in up at the front. Gets the taunt through. But they're not getting the follow-up or any kind of kill. And the pressure mounts up. It still continues as Urel was forced down to the bottom of the map to defend. Up at the top, the Garden Terror is still doing some work. And over here in the middle, the fort gets destroyed. Team Sven with such a huge amount of momentum. It's insane, honestly. The keep is gone. They're going for Johan and they're going for White Mane. Both of them die. And that opens up more opportunities for the red team. They want the core, as it seems, are already making a play for it, are looking to follow up with additional kills here. Not sure if they can already go for core, since we are at like a 20 second death timer. They might even lose a hero! Rega, he gets killed! Riga's down, but so is Chromie. She's there too. Zagara still trying to get some damage in against the core, and they're sticking with it. The shield is gone, and they're getting damage in. Can they take the entire thing down though? That's the big question. Zagara is low, dancing around it. They might die, and they do. 30% Nano trying to come in here. Sven, Gaslo, Gaslo, praise the Lord. Hail to the king, baby. Hail to the king, baby. <laughs> and it's. It's game. GG. Team Sven, not even close with a W. Well done.